Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to our second session here. Um, what we're going to be uh, talking about is the, um, is the new evolution that has to happen, and that's the evolution at the speed of thought. Uh, for those who don't know who I am, my name is Sandy Monroe. I uh, have a company that does um, uh, mostly new product development, but we've also got a YouTube channel, which has become extremely popular, called Monroe Live. Um, we, um, we work with a lot of OEMs, we work with a lot of Tier 1s, um, and we don't just work in automotive, we work in lots of different things. So the auto industry is at a precipice as far as I'm concerned, and um, we're in a monumental shift on how vehicles are going to be created from concept to production. Traditional OEMs and established supplier bases are being pushed to do more faster with less. ICE is not EV and we've got tons of examples of that because we've torn apart almost every electric vehicle that's in the marketplace and has been even remotely successful and we've found that those people who've decided to somehow stick a battery in an ICE vehicle and call it electric um, has failed. Uh, the shift to electrification is challenging in every facet of the design cycle and manufacturing realm <clears throat> There's a great deal of pressure to innovate at the speed of thought. Now, uh, for those of you who are OEMs or know about OEMs, innovation takes forever. They have a group called the, um, the uh, Change Board. And basically, if you're an engineer, and I was at Ford Motor Company for a while, and uh, we called them the No Change Board. They, their job was to basically crush innovation because innovation means we got to change something or we might have to spend some money. Those days have got to go um, and they've got to go quickly if the OEMs want to survive. Actually, uh, just a quick one, I, uh, I can tell you that one of the next videos that Monroe Live is going to have, I'm going to talk about the finances that are associated with everybody in the business and all of them fall under, under a a line that, uh, that uh, escapes me right now, but it's called a Y line. And that Y line basically says who's going to survive and who's at risk. And pretty much everybody except for Tesla falls below that line. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to introduce our panelists and, um, and we're going to bring them up one at a time. They're going to give you a little brief on what they do and how they do it and a little description about themselves. And we're going to try and move quickly so that you can all get a chance to ask questions. Uh, we do have a good panel here talking about real life issues and problems and solutions. So, um, so with that, I'd like to uh, bring up uh, Rick Sturgeon. He's the uh, Senior Director for Transportation and Mobility from Dassault Systems. So if we can, let's bring him up with a big round of applause. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sandy. So, from an introduction, you know, I'm an engineer that became a CIO a couple times and then realized IT isn't where you wanted to be. So, I was uh, ran engineering operations at a company at Johnson Controls for many years until uh, I came back and really work at the SO, trying to help people like many of you, uh, you know, use software. So, let's just do a quick introduction. Uh, go ahead with the slide or oh. I normally have somebody I can say, click, click. They're not here today. OK. There should be a video here. Enabled modern society to evolve and prosper depends on mobility. The early innovators brought trains, subway systems, and industrialized the mass production of cars, empowering the world with the previously unforeseen freedom of movement. But today, these industries are facing a massive revolution. Manufacturers must not only comply with increased regulations, but entirely redefine the future of mobility. Cities, citizens, and industries require smarter, safer, more sustainable, customized, and personalized experiences from electric autonomous connected vehicles 
to bold new shared mobility options and services, driving a fundamental transformation of how we transport people and goods, unlocking a landscape of new profitable and sustainable opportunities. Dassault Systems 3D Experience Platform is the enabler, unleashing the next generation of vehicle innovators by enhancing the real world with the virtual world, connecting and simulating the entire life cycle and extended supply chain. From planning, design, engineering and testing, to manufacturing and experiencing, through a single collaborative environment with full visibility, capturing vast shared intelligence, accelerating new exciting vehicles and shared mobility services, on target with shorter cycle time. Transforming the way the world moves by harmonizing product, nature, and life. In a future made possible by virtual universes, experience the future today. So what that video really said, should have said, or tried to say, is it's a cloud platform with everything in it. You could uh, develop, and they do develop, a Boeing aircraft or an Airbus aircraft with, or many of the vehicles. Now, this was supposed to be a progressive slide. Okay. So in any case, having a platform like that is one thing. How to use it is another. Now, as Sandy said, this slide, which was supposed to you know, click down, it really says that everything's changing. And I think we all know that. Uh, you know, mobility, uh, the dream of um, you know, the public space being redefined. Uh, like when I go out to Seattle to see my daughters, rather than $1,000 for a vehicle uh, to rent, I would just like to have my autonomous car there and tell it to pick me up at the uh, airport. And then when I'm up in the mountains, tell it to go back and get us groceries. That's my dream, but it's all personalized. And um, in essence, at the end of this slide, what we really want to do is redefine our lives, redefine public space. And um, so in essence, to do that, though, what we figured out at the SO, working with many of the companies, both the cities at Singapore and uh, the majority, vast majority of the EV companies use our platform, is just having the tools is not enough. You have to actually have a complete virtual twin of, not, of the city that you're going to operate in, of the manufacturing plants you're going to create in, and that's what we're building toward, and uh, it really makes the difference because Right now, if you think about when the iPhone came out, in my time, it started out with half a dozen apps, right? And probably the people that were developing that iPhone thought, this is great, you're going to be able to, God knows, play uh, Space Invaders now while you're talking on your phone. There's several million now. So what mobility is going to need, mean to all of us, that integration between the auto, the city, and us, product, nature, and life, as we like to say, uh, it has to be explored, it has to be invented, and that's our focus, to invent the future. So to do that, uh, on our platform, you start out with the mobility experience. You really start giving a place where people, all the stakeholders can engage and start imagining what would be possible. And at that point, you go down and you have to engineer it, and you have to do it quickly and you have to have the capability to produce it, and ultimately the mobility services to monitor, so it's a complete uh, circle, I guess. As an example, we talked a bit when we started out about manufacturing. This is an example of where today, if the video runs, you can literally go in and scan an existing plant and just shoot out the other end of it, a virtual twin, and then start going through your ideas on how you'll change it. I was a manufacturing engineer early in my career. I remember spending, you know, six months trying to create that thing over there, and it probably wasn't right. Now it's six days, so a huge change. We talked about speed. Now, what does that mean from a business perspective? Automotive, at least the legacy automotive, is totally ROI finance driven. So why would you spend money on these things? Well, if you start looking at having the virtual twin integrated as you're, man as you're designing, you start seeing all these places where there's waste in the Japanese term. And these are real numbers that we've seen in multiple cases. ECR, that's a change notice. I know that from my days at Johnson Controls. That's just money. You know, each one of them can cost anywhere from a few hundred dollars to $10,000. Less is better. It speeds the time. Now, what we provide, and I'm staying on the manufacturing theme, 
uh, clear across this manufacturing process validation supply chain these things need to be developing as you're developing the vehicle and everybody needs to be doing it together including the supply base so here and I'm, I'm about done we have a uh, flow of all these sort of pre-done applications across the whole life cycle to do that now this is an example of what I was talking about before. On the left is what they call model-based systems engineering, where from all stakeholders, you design at a detailed level what the requirements are, not just the electronics, but what's the experience, et cetera, down there with all that, uh, no magic is our product. But it's also looking out into the actual place where this will happen, including the development of the UI that'll go with it. And this becomes one mobility application out of what I think is gonna be 10,000 probably the next big opportunity for money because mobility apps pay well. Now, if we think about all the things that can be done, the vehicle integration, designing the motor, the validation, the manufacturing, and certainly all the battery chemistry where we're heavily engaged, this all happens. Now to finish it out, and I think this is the coolest thing, we made an investment in a company called AV Simulation, which is really the I'm on the SAE committee that has developed the standards for validating an autonomous vehicle. And I will tell you, at Johnson Controls, I did about a third of the seats in the world. And we, you know, we had a lot of things to hit. This is 10, 20 times more complex to get all the use cases for safety. So this is an example where as you're developing, literally you're in the CATIA, in our case designing, you can start testing and seeing the corner cases that are going to happen. That's the future. And it's a huge change. And uh, right now, some of our uh, EV customers that are on our cloud are seeing one-tenth of the cost and one-third of the time to develop a vehicle. And our legacy OEMs need to get there, or as Sandy said, they won't be. Okay? Okay, so um, um, I'm going to tell you right now that, um, that uh, I am a big fan of what you just saw. Um, I am a fan of, of Autodesk as well, but at the end of the day, what we need to do is we need to figure out how we're going to get to the vision that was just presented. Um, and um, if you have a congressman or a senator or somebody like that, maybe you can ask them to promote self-driving as opposed to killing self-driving. I'm, um, I, I don't know what's going on with our uh, government, but um, we, have to, uh, we have to push them along because they're also an impediment. Next up is um, John Cottrell, and he's the vice president of the American Iron and Steel Institute. Now, people are saying, well, wait a minute, we've got to have aluminum or we have to have plastic for, uh, for cars, but you know what? You use the right tool for the right job, and quite frankly, I can make um, I can make a car out of steel that's almost as light as uh, one that's made out of uh, just aluminum. So, uh, with that, let's bring uh, let's bring John up. Thank you so much, John. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So let's see if we get my slides up here. There we go. So, as Sandy said, I'm. Uh, John Carroll, Vice President of the Automotive Program under uh, AISI. Uh, just some of my past experience, I actually started as a, a vehicle uh, body engineer in the UK way back. I'm over 40 years in the industry now. Uh, when I came over here, I spent a lot of my time at one of those big OEMs that uh, Sandy uh, mentioned, uh, General Motors. I was there for 17 years. Uh, there I did uh, chassis uh, components, body components, I was also in the innovation team, so I was on that leading edge of innovation. And as Sandy said, at those large OEMs, it is difficult, but basically you have to be uh, persistent and keep pushing the innovation forward. Um, now in my current job, I, I believe one of the keys to going fast is actually collaboration. And there's been more and more of this happening over the last couple of years. I've got another slide to demonstrate that. So basically we have an automotive applications uh, council that has Ursula, Middle, Cliffs, and Nucor as part of that. We work with the OEMs directly to help develop uh, lighter weight solutions using third gen advanced strength steels, for example, Martin sites that can be used to protect the battery systems and such. 
Uh, we also have a collaborative organization called the Auto Steel Partnership, where we work directly with General Motors, Toyota, and Stellantis on a lot of manufacturing solutions. So how do you weld the material, uh, the steel material, how do you form it, how do you actually engineer it to be these wild, lightweight solutions. And the key here is we're talking to our customers, and I think one of the important things about going fast is understanding what your customer needs exactly so you can deliver it first time to them correct. In the old system where you would develop things on your own and then go sell it to the OEMs, it wouldn't always naturally fit their requirements. So you had to do some tweaking and so there was a lot of backwards and forwards. Now it's very important to understand exactly what your customer wants, when they want it, and then of course you've got to deliver it to them on time. Um, Sandy also uh, talked about um, the decision making too a little bit. There's a lot of not invented here in the OEMs, but I think that's starting to dissipate and go away. Um, and I've got a slide where I'll talk about that briefly. We also work with the World Auto Steel uh, Organization, which is a global organization. And currently, they are actually working on an autonomous electric vehicle called Steel Emotive. I'd encourage you to uh, look it up online. And, and they're developing a lightweight steel electric vehicle uh, that would be uh, used by surface providers as an autonomous vehicle. So just talking about that uh, collaboration, this is not necessarily up to date. This is just to demonstrate when ho the whole mobility thing came along, obviously, and going autonomous, a lot of the OEMs did not have that expertise in-house. So they went out and got it. This was a good sign of them willing to listen to others and get input and help from others. Nobody can go on this journey directly on their own. Nobody is big enough, large enough now to make that happen. So a key is this collaboration by both OEMs and outside companies to make this future a reality. Uh, we in the steel industry continue to innovate. We now have a large suite of materials. Again, we're developing these materials based upon what our customers are telling us they need moving forward. The third gen of advanced side strain steels, which is the retained austenite at the end, uh, at the bottom of the list there, is essentially a high grade material that you can cold form so you can basically make more complex shapes and have high strength parts. Again, important in protecting the battery system, uh, roof crush, uh, occupant protection, and those sort of things. And then I've, got, I've only got one more slide. Another important thing, as we heard from Dassault, is computer aided engineering is very key to going fast. So in the steel industry, we can now apply integrated computational materials engineering to essentially develop the materials in the computer, basically get the recipe, as it were, develop the recipe, prove it out. This then gives you the material cards directly out of the simulation. You can then go make the materials, in this case we did, and, and basically we achieve the properties that were actually uh, predicted by the computer. This was actually sponsored by the Department of Energy. This was like a $6 million program to prove that you could go do this. So simulation is very important. It's come a long way. When I first started doing simulation, all we had was contour plots, and it was on a black and white screen. That's when I started. It is just phenomenal now what you can do with a computer engineering. And most companies now don't even validate through testing. They're basically validating their models, which is essentially, in a way, validating the product. Uh, that's all I had for today. Hopefully, we get some good questions, and uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you, Rob. And uh, next up, what we've got is, um, hmm, uh, I'm not sure which one. I got, uh, which, which, which order are we going in? Are you going up next, Rob? Or? Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to go in this order then. So, uh, Peter Dubra. Uh, Deraz, Derazzo? Drizel. Okay, great. Sorry, I'm uh, uh, not very good at this job. But anyway, um, he's the director of global research and product development for the automotive group of PPG, and I'd like to bring him up with a big round of applause. Thank you very much, Peter. You, Sorry about the name. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. I appreciate it. Uh, pleasure to be here. Again, my name is Peter Votruba Drizel. Uh, I've been with PPG about 16 years and I lead the research and product development groups for our automotive, industrial, and mobility groups. So, uh, you know, building on Sandy's comments, yeah, obviously we're in the midst of a powertrain revolution. 
And it's very exciting for PPG as a coding supplier because it's given us an opportunity to drive uh, innovations into the powertrain uh, through coatings. So I'd like to start this morning first by uh, introducing you to the PPG purpose. Play the video, please. Why do our 47,000 employees come to work every day? To help communities come together and grow in more inspiring spaces. To preserve the environment for future generations. To protect the world around us from the elements and everything else. At PPG, what drives us is our purpose. Our passion to create products that protect and beautify what matters most to you. Products that enable you to make a home that's distinctively yours. To show off your personality. To make lasting memories like this. And to rest a little easier. At PPG, our family of researchers, chemists, and professionals in more than 70 countries around the world have one purpose. We protect and beautify the world. All right. So as we think about the revolution in the powertrain, the growth of mobility is creating multiple opportunities for the use of PPG technology. Specifically, what we'll talk about today is within the battery pack and the battery pack systems. So we, we know from uh, the, the replacement of the, in, the internal combustion engine, we have a lot of drivers that we need to improve. That's range, uh, that's uh, speed of charge, uh, safety, uh, as well as get down to cost parity uh, with the internal combustion engine. Tied to that then is as we move to coatings into that battery pack system, we have this tremendous opportunity to further improve the ESG through the supply chain in, with the, each of the OEMs. So as Sandy uh, mentioned at the opening, big investments, big investments happening now in the ground today, driving towards, again, uh, conversion into the full battery electric vehicles. As we look into that space, Great challenges as a coding supplier to provide value for the OEMs to accelerate this transformation. As, as Sandy referred to, new ways of working, the speed of innovation, real time to bring in these innovations and stand these up from what was just a few thousand of electric vehicles made per year to tens to hundred thousands of electric vehicles in full production. So we see opportunities and products around fire protection, to protect the occupants in the event of a thermal runway uh, in battery electric vehicles. Dielectric isolation, the lifeblood of electrically isolating within the battery pack systems, but also providing the functionality to drive thermal conductivity, to move heat in and out of the battery system to maintain the, oper the operating performance and maximum life efficiency of the battery pack. Tied then further into the thermal management, as I just mentioned. Uh, th those combinations of technologies of isolation and thermal management. So here I'll conclude with showing solutions for electrification. Uh, you can see across the battery pack system a number of technologies and opportunities to drive innovation in the, into the battery electric vehicle space. So anode and cathode increasing the range, the performance of the battery vehicles, uh, so that you can get the 10-year lifetime and uh, maintain your, your mileage uh, over the course of, of the vehicle's lifetime, to then thermal conductivity, as I mentioned, connecting thermally the systems within the battery pack so you can move heat in and out of the system so it'll perform whether it's really cold out in the middle of winter and uh, you have to uh, drive long distances or in the uh, heat of the desert uh, that, again, the battery will perform. And tied to that will be all of these trade-offs as the powertrain transformation occurs. Each of the OEMs is now standing up their own design teams that allows them to look at the trade-offs between dielectric solutions, thermal materials, battery fire protection, et cetera, and the overall system approach to get to the best cost and best performance and highest safety uh, for their consumers. So with that, I'll conclude. Oh, thank you, Ben. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. <clears throat> so anyway, one of the uh, one of the things that I want to do is um, <clears throat> I want to have uh, Peter tell us how <clears throat> we can um, 
we can get photovoltaic paint so that um, every car could be um, basically coated with something that would, in essence, act as a solar panel. So um, I'm sure that I'll have that question for you. You can think on it sure. for a bit. Anyway, before we, uh, before we get into the Q&A, let me introduce Rob. <coughs> um, Rob uh, Helsley, um, he is um, the Industrial Engineering Director for Broza North America. Uh, Broza probably doesn't need much introduction, but I'm uh, sure, that, uh, sure that Rob is going to help you out. So anyway, thanks, Rob. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you for the introduction. As you mentioned, my name is Rob Heltzley, so I'm head of our North American Industrial Engineering Department at Broza. Uh, what that includes is assembly technology as well as component engineering. So in layman's terms, it means we're responsible for the development and execution of our assembly equipment, as well as our component tooling design, both in plastic and metal forming, uh, as well as the centralized uh, repository of all of our core technology specialists, so automation, testing, fastening, riveting, welding, et cetera. Um, again, I work for Bros in North America, or as those that pronounce it outside of the automotive industry say, who? So, uh, <laughs> Broza in 60 seconds, just as a, as a precursor to this and maybe my unique perspective uh, versus the panelists here, we are a mechatronics company. We are founded in 1908 by Max Broza, so we're over a century, year old, century old. Uh, we are a private, family-owned company, and we have a global footprint, which includes 65 locations in over 24 countries, servicing 80 customers. We do roughly 5 billion euro in sales per year. And an important point to note here is that almost a dime for every dollar that we bring in goes back into R&D. So improving our processes and products to better suit our customers in the future. What are those products, you might ask? Um, so as I said, we're a worldwide leader in mechatronics, meaning if it is a mechanical structure that moves with electronic control, that's probably us. Uh, if it isn't, give us a call. We can do it. Uh, we focus in three main business units, which is exterior, interior, and drives. So the exterior is anything that opens and closes. So your window regulators, your side door latches, your power lift gates, your hands-free access, etc. Interior is seat structures and seat components, uh, as well as center consoles. So we do first row seats, second row seats, third row, back frets, backrest, lumbar, etc. And lastly, our drivetrains, our, our drives division, which is basically electric motors uh, used in HVAC, cooling fan modules, drivetrain actuators, electronic braking and steering systems. So that's who we are and what we do, but now how do we respond to the evolution in the automotive industry? And this is where I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is it's an extremely simple answer, and that is, we go faster. The bad news is how or why, and, and if you really introspectively look at your company and, and the time it takes you to get to market, the odds are you're gonna come to the realization that you're part of the problem. Uh, these automotive companies in, of the past or of now uh, have really antiquated hierarchies, organizational structures, and processes. At least this is the conclusion that our shareholders came to in 2018, where we decided we needed to revamp the way we do business. And we launched Future Broza, which is our renewal program to address all of these inefficiencies in our time to market. There's a lot here, but I'll boil it down to three main things. We focused on uh, communication, tools, and people. So the communication, we got rid of anything that wasn't value added in our hierarchy. So we got rid of archaic structures, hierarchies, processes of development, et cetera. We take our competent engineers and we give them the tools to make decisions faster. So we've increased our simulation, our digitalization, our automation of forms and templates, all of the things that is paper pushing in, in silos to feed another service. We've communicated all of this together. And lastly, we've we worked on developing our people to instill an entrepreneurial mindset that allows them to think and act independently. So there's not this revision loop of approval or going in front of a board or preparing whatever. So those are the three main topics that we focused on. Since I have 
four minutes and I'm a manufacturing guy, let's focus on one key initiative, which is called Broza Prime. And that stands for Powered by Integrated Manufacturing Engineering. Yes, that is really what it stands for. Yes, we took some artistic license there to make it catchy, so just go with it. Uh, but essentially what we've done is we've taken all the data that we used to compile in silos between the product design area, 3D design, prints, etc., all of the customer project management tools that we used to use, Excel spreadsheets, whatever, uh, and then the production and execution side. Uh, and we've removed all of the silos and we made a seamless end-to-end -end process with interconnected data and processes. This gives us the ability to track our progress automatically, track our total costs of ownership from cradle to grave, as well as manage our KPIs automatically without having to generate reports and such. So how are we doing that? Rick already touched on uh, Dassault's tools, but we are an adopter of this, so I won't go into the details of that. I'll just say how we're using it. So we've decided to get the end-to-end -end seamless flow of information via Dassault tools. So we use Katia in our design and engineering side. We use Delmia within our production planning processes, and we use Aprizo as our manufacturing execution system. And what's really important here is this creates a single source of truth that single source of truth that everyone is working on in real time. There is no more revision loops. There is no more needs for meetings or redundancy. Everyone is on the same level of information at the same time. And what's really helped us to, to quicken our time to market in this arena is by having this digital master available and continuously updated in real time. So what we do is we now add specialist tools on top of that. Um, so we have highly competent people that are, that are working on additive manufacturing so that we can get parts and fixture holdings quicker. We have our forming and welding teams that are using simulation tools to give continuous feedback for design for manufacturing and some simultaneous engineering back to the design teams. And last, we, we see on the production floor what all of these changes equal in real time, whether it's impacting scrap, OEE, cost, et cetera. And when we make these engineering changes to improve that, it goes back into an automatic PDCA cycle so that the design teams are staying in real time with this information. So it, it cuts out all of that cross flow. And lastly, how do we, how, what's the mindset that we use to approach this? I think uh, everyone in the automotive industry knows lean, so I won't go too much into that. But essentially, this is your, your standardized, efficient, scalable framework, meaning a widget's a widget. If we have to add more capacity, we're able to do so through automation or through clever design so that we commonize parts. But we also have an agile framework that we're able to, to operate in, which means we're able to be flexible. We're able to make uh, exp exploration, which is the fun way of saying fail fast, fail quick. So we're able to explore and simulate ideas and innovations and see if they work quickly, and if not, we dump them and we carry forward with what we have. Uh, it also allows for better design for manufacturing loops because we're simultaneously adding the next bit of value before moving on. Um, and the pragmatic approach between these two things is the, the way to say we use common sense with this. We have very competent program managers that have this as a tool set, and through that, they're able to determine do we need a go fast project or do we need a standard project and use the tools at their disposal to enable that based on the customer requirements. So that was a lot. I thank you for listening. And if anyone was playing buzzword bingo during that and you got a coverall, you can get your prize at credentials. But thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Rob. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop one question up and then I'll open it up to the audience. That'll give you a chance to start thinking of that very difficult question that will stump the stars here. So I'm going to start off with Rob. Okay, Rob, um, you're in steering. Um, I worked on the 787. And we have no mechanical between where the joystick is for the, uh, for the pilot and uh, the ailerons or the flaps or slats or anything else. Um, I work on spaceships. We have no mechanical componentry that goes between the brains of the uh, spaceship and the uh, controllers, like the rockets. And I work on a lot of other things, medical devices, and we don't have any mechanical interface between the impulse or the input electronically 
and whatever moves uh, for whatever medical device I happen to be working on. So can you elaborate a little bit on the steering system for every car on the planet? Um, and this would be a great opportunity to, <laughs> to really shine. That's good. <clears throat> Thank you for that question. Uh, so just to clarify, we do steering motors, uh, which are now powering the drive train and power steering. But I think you touched on an important part here about the loss of mechanical linkage between this and how moving to the future, particular we, particularly with without an ICE engine, we don't have something that's creating hydraulic pressure, right? So this needs to run off electricity. And this is really where Broza has kind of shined, that they're developing on, on new and innovative ways to have power steering pumps that are powered without an accessory takeoff on the front of the engine or something like this. So this is really where, you know, we're developing towards the future to supplement the EV technologies by getting rid of mechanical structures and instead of doing this uh, via electronics, battery operation, et cetera. And, and these can be closed loop systems without feedback because we now have development in radar sensing and near field communication sensing. So we're able to get the haptic feedback that you would otherwise have from a mechanical system, but we're able to incorporate that with our electronics and our engineering to, to provide that solution. So how long before we see the uh, steering column disappear? I mean, you still need to apply leverage to turn the wheels. So the pump's not going anywhere, but the way that the pump is powered is. So we're getting rid of mechanical, and we're going towards electric, and that's going to be done through motors. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm just looking at the other chunk of uh, iron that seems to go between the steering wheel and uh, the rack, which I, uh, I'm trying to get rid of extra weight and... Um, and I think a couple of wires would be better than like a great big chunk of iron. So that's kind of... Yeah, sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so interesting story. My oldest daughter went to Boeing, actually, to work on the 787. Oh, really? And uh, she was working on the automated landing control when she first went there. And, you know, I, being the father, I said, well, let's go and see what's going on there. And she took me down to the, you know, demo center or whatever. And, I went in there and she was showing me the ones I fly in today, the old stuff. Then she took me to the new stuff and, you know, she was showing me how it all works with a little joystick. And she said, but the pilots, we still leave the wheel or whatever you call it in there because it makes the pilots feel more comfortable, but it doesn't do anything. <laughs> and, um, and, I, and now Airbus, on the other hand, I play hockey with a guy that flies both planes and Airbus has gotten rid of, rid of the wheel. It's all you know, just the stick. So I think, you know, we're headed there, but, you know, again, with the virtual twin we create, and actually we've invested very heavily in uh, uh, a system that can actually really look at all the cases in the control software, you know, just run millions of scenarios, and it always does turn up things that, eh, they might not happen, but they might. And so the to the point of getting rid or making it all fly by wire, it just raises the level of, uh, let's say, testing, difficulty, engineering, virtualization of the vehicle to a, to a whole, whole nother level. And of course, we saw with Boeing where they missed one, right? And so I believe, though, that that'll happen pretty quickly because, as Sandy said, the advantage is so high and the capability is there as long as we engineer it. So timing-wise, who knows? But I think sooner than later. Yeah, I, I was going to say, too, you mentioned legislation earlier. Yeah. So steer by wire is also a legislation concern, right? Because they like that direct mechanical connection. So right. they'll definitely have to show, just like aircraft, there's got to be some redundant systems just to make sure. But I, I think you're right. I've spent a lot of my career trying to not put dents in my rail to avoid the steering rack, right? Yeah. So it would be great <laughs> if the steering rack wasn't in the way like it usually is, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, let me do this. Let me open it up to the audience now that you've had a chance for, uh, you know, thinking about this. And uh, do we have any uh, questions for our panelists? Oh my gosh, a shy crowd. I can't believe it. Well, okay, <laughs> I have one. And I'm gonna go right back. Now I've given him a chance. I've given Peter a chance to think about 
what I really want. So, Peter, give me the good news on the uh, photovoltaic paint that you're creating right now. Sure. Well, yeah, Sandy, that's uh, existed for quite some time. Uh, the challenge has just been the conversion factor is uh, to convert sunlight into usable electrons is relatively low. So with the amount of surface area on the car, you, you really can't get a significant charge uh, to, to impact the overall uh, range of the vehicle. Th that being said, there's a lot of concepts around mobility in collection and storage of that energy and ultimately you know, small short grid distribution uh, of, that, uh, of that energy. So you know, we'll continue to see opportunities to take coatings in new spaces of functionality. So for example, um, you think about the air conditioning systems in the electric vehicles. Those have a condenser and a pump system. It has a certain amount of energy that it takes to cool that vehicle. We have IR reflective coatings that allow you to cool that vehicle, prevent the absorption of that heat allows you to downsize on the pumps and you can actually drive anywhere between three and 5% greater range in electric vehicles. See the same thing as you talked about the motors in the last question, all of those motors will need electromagnetic protection. You've got this big battery system, if it's not in a Faraday cage of the, of the metal, if it's a fiberglass solution, for example, then you're gonna need coating solutions to basically isolate those systems to allow those communications to occur. Yeah, you know, I think that almost everybody, um, everybody on the planet is looking at uh, battery cases <clears throat> and what's the pros and cons of the different materials that are out there. So uh, one of the things that we had discussed um, um, prior to this meeting was w what is the direction that people are taking in battery cases. So I thought maybe um, yours would be to coat whatever, uh, and maybe if it's plastic, but what about aluminum and steel? So let me uh, shift gears and uh, toss one at you. What do you think? Yeah, so, so yeah, there's, there's been a, an initial trend w with the emerging companies to go yeah. with an aluminum battery box, right? Uh, however, there are some uh, disadvantages with that in that obviously the initial cost is, is a little bit more with the aluminum. Uh, also, uh, you typically, and you've probably found this, Sandy, when you're tearing down vehicles, you typically need a little bit more space when you're engineering and aluminum vehicles. The sections tend to be a little larger. So we've seen a trend with the, the more mature OEMs. They do seem to be going more in the direction of a steel solution for the battery box. They're a lot more comfortable with it. It does give you the, um, the ability to uh, have a slightly uh, smaller section, which gives you a little bit more package space. <laughs> Uh, you can also protect it, you know, from a corrosion standpoint, obviously with galvanizing and things like that. And then you've got the strength uh, benefit of, you know, as you might, you're aware, you, you can allow basically next to no defamation of that battery enclosure. So you've got to protect the battery like you would a, an occupant. You basically do not want any intrusion. You don't want any, any uh, you, you can, you can, uh, undergo some g-forces but not, but not too too large so um, we had an initial uh, uh, alternate material sort of approach to the battery boxes but we're seeing uh, more of a trend uh, to applying the steel and actually we're doing a bit of a study right now ourselves where we're going to investigate what are the material choices going to be moving forward and we think we see a trend where the advanced high strength steels and the martin sites will start to basically uh, show a foothold in that in that area, mostly because of, of protection reasons. Yeah. So this is where um, this is where Dassault's product can uh, help us out a lot as an engineer. So what I'd like to do is ask um, maybe uh, maybe a question that may be uh, controversial, but anyway, have you um, at Dassault uh, figured out how or what the best or more the most optimal battery case might be? Has anyone done a study, here's the aluminum solution, here's the plastic solution, here's the steel solution, or any other solution that may have come up? Have you, have you got something that you can well, help us well, out with Well, actually, there? we have, although it's a lot broader than that. And uh, <clears throat> again, you know, a few names from Tesla to Neo to Rivian, they're all using this stuff. And, and then the OEM, the legacy OEMs, or the big OEMs is a better way to put it, came in. And so, 
you know, our software is like any software. You have to do configuration, you have to do usage, but there was so much demand for that question and the broader question, how would you design an electric vehicle to make it optimal? Which sort of depends. It depends mm -hmm. on what you're doing. You know, is it a truck, yeah. is it a whatever? So we actually, in my group, it's called the TNM group, the transportation group uh, back in France, we developed a capability that's in pretty heavy use uh, we, we're very active in the battery chemistry space with an acquisition we made called Biovia. They were actually the leader in creating drugs and then, you know, doing millions, millions of molecules. We've repurposed that for batteries and that includes all the materials and everything else. We also can have the simulation of the electric motor, literally uh, uh, simulating the fluid, the sound of the fluid moving in the motor, as well as the whole structure and dynamics of the vehicle. And we have that in one model with, I think it's like dozens, if not more, simulations that can all run concurrently. And then it'll do the, uh, you know, the Taguchi studies, as I call yeah. them in my old thing, or the trade-offs. Now, it still depends on who's using it, who's putting it in. But I would say, what should the material be? How should it be isolated, the things you've said? It depends. Right. And of course, cost yeah. is a big factor. So again, yeah. we're a tool, but uh, that's the way the world's going. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'll, you I'll, I'll just add to that. So, it, as you know, it's it can be volume uh, dependent. You know, yeah. what's the volume of your vehicle as you get higher volume? We know that steel becomes very competitive from a from a high volume production standpoint. And then, uh, the OEMs are now talking and the suppliers about sustainability. How sustainable is the material that you're using? Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and steel does have a good sustainability story. Uh, especially when you look at energy used to, to basically make the material. So that's starting to become a, a parameter and don't know if you can put that into your software we're, we're where you've got a sustainability yeah, assessment. We, we sustainability has to be, um, in our software, we, we have a, you know, a, a software that is used up front to, uh, to calculate what the total accounted cost is. And in the Europe and in, um, and in um, uh, the Far East, sustainability, carbon footprint, whatever you want to call it, is a big deal. And so we put it in actually based on Boeing. Boeing wanted to know, and that's kind of like why we, we developed that software. Sustainability is huge. And that's where I think uh, some of the automotive companies fall down because they don't, they don't get into the, uh, the detail of, well, what happens at end of life? Well, I don't care. I, I sold the car, I'm done now. That, that's, that's kind of where the problem lies. When, when back, I spoke at the battery show last week, and you know, when you're speaking, you don't lear typically learn a, a, a ha. But the aha for me was, um, in, you know, came from one of the people, that obviously there isn't an infrastructure yet in place for uh, recycling lithium ion, et cetera. That's a problem. And the person put forward, and it's it's a sustainability problem because there's a huge amount of CO2 that's required to make the material, but much much less, maybe you know hardly any comparison to reuse the material. Right. So if you really think about that, and these guys probably from the material side that's obvious, but me from the other side it's really not obvious. That uh, you know if we were perfect, we could just uh, you know make enough lithium ion batteries for, I don't know, X million of vehicles and then just keep using it forever and no more CO2. Yeah, well, well. Uh, but some of the battery is reuse it for another purpose, like you can repurpose it from a vehicle to say a household or, or right. uh, yeah. you know, a, util a utility and things yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah, reuse versus recycling. Reuse is much better. If we can get into that, but um, what we're getting into is uh, the end of the show and I'm a big fan of closing out um, on time. But, um, but just because I screwed up his name, Peter, you, you're standing here trembling. Go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to jump in. Uh, you know, again, when we talk about steel versus aluminum, you know, the total life cycle carbon footprint of those solutions to protect and beautify those is where we're playing. So you know, building on that theme, driving environmental sustainability through the solutions that protect from corrosion, you know, yeah. in these battery fires, you still will penetrate through uncoated steel or aluminum very, very quickly. So these overall coating solutions yeah. uh, can, can really drive value uh, in the overall performance of the, of the battery system. Right. So with that, um, we were talking about batteries. And, um, and uh, this is a show where you're supposed to see new technologies and whatnot. So 
One thing um, I will tell you is that there's a company that was um, just formed in Michigan, and, um, and they're basically uh, just down the road a bit, um, and they're recycling and building batteries. They're going to vertical integration, so they're taking old batteries, recycling them, using the materials to build, build new batteries. That's one Michigan company, and then there's another one. Um, it's not a Michigan company, but maybe uh, somebody from the government can talk them into it. These are uh, 2170 batteries. There's three of them here. They come from uh, China. This, this one battery from, uh, what's their name? Lighten. Oh, never mind. The guy is here already. Anyhow, what a sales guy. Anyway, this one has the same amount of power as these three. What will that do for you, boys and girls? Yeah. If I can take three of these lightened batteries, then I can either do one of two things. I can reduce the amount of weight by, obviously, two-thirds, or I can increase the range by two-thirds. And for all those people with the range anxiety and stuff like that, um, the range on a Bentley, the new Bentley that came out, is uh, 380 miles. And the range on a comparable electric car, which would be the Plaid, is uh, 385 miles. I think that range anxiety has got to come. I, I'm hoping there's some press people here. Take that out of your lexicon. We, we don't have range anxiety, only, uh, only opportunities. So with that, I'd like to thank this uh, August uh, 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 group of folks here that we brought up. I'd like to thank you all for attending, and I'd like to thank you all as well for listening. And with that, um, let's give our speakers a big round of applause.